Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today, Addressing STEM Stereotypes with Youth and Young Adults. My name is Amanda Sullivan, and I work with the National Girls Collaborative Project, and I'm so excited to be hosting this really important topic, um, really great and juicy webinar with all of you here today. Thank you so much for joining. Just a few housekeeping tips before we get started. We'd like to ask you to keep yourself muted when you enter, when the participants are speaking, and actually throughout the whole presentation, since we will have a pretty big group with us today. But you are encouraged to be active in the chat. We already have many of you really active in there right now. So share your questions, your comments, your resources, and introduce yourselves in the chat. And we have a team of NGCP folks moderating the chat for you today. Nancy Nancy Scales Coddington and Karen Peterson, who you'll hear from in just a minute. And if you have any tech issues, you need help getting the auto transcripts on your computer or anything like that, please feel free to message Nancy and she will help you out with all of that. But now it is my great pleasure to turn it over to our CEO at NGCP, Karen Peterson, to tell you a little bit more about what we do at NGCP and what we're all about. Karen? Thanks so much, Amanda. It's great to see some of Amanda's fans here in the chat as well, because we're big fans of Amanda as well. We're so glad that she's on staff helping to lead our national webinars. Um, so thanks, everyone. I see so many colleagues, and I see new collaborators as well. So welcome to this webinar. So the National Girls Collaborative Project is a national network of diverse stakeholders who are advancing the agenda in gender equity. We bring together organizations that are committed to informing and encouraging girls to consider STEM. And as a network of networks, our reach is broad. The programs in our network serve 20 million girls. And because many of our programs also serve boys, we reach more than 12 million boys as well. NGCP has been transforming STEM for 20 years. Our vision is to support and create STEM experiences that are as diverse as this world that we live in. And to create change, our work empowers providers, educators, leaders, and youth themselves. Next slide, please. NGCP believes that STEM skills can be acquired by anyone and fostered in everyone. And our initiatives build confidence and create a community of lifelong STEM activators. And through the power of collaboration, we spark curiosity and develop a passion for STEM. We share resources and solutions with a coalition of leaders and via our website, newsletters, online databases, social media, and webinars like this one. We also strengthen the capacity of programs by sharing exemplary practices, research, and program models. When programs are stronger and more sustainable, girls and youth are better served. And we distribute these resources in accessible ways such as train the trainer programs and online platforms. And finally, we are leveraging our network of girl serving STEM programs, advocates and youth so that together we can create the tipping point for gender equity in STEM. Next slide, great, thanks. So the National Girls Collaborative Project engages in many activities virtually and nationally, as well as working through our local collaboratives. We partner with organizations to scale and deliver content such as the Leap into Science National Network in partnership with the Franklin Institute. And we work with the Million Girl Moonshot in partnership with STEM Next and the Mott After School State Network, serving hundreds of educators via local networks. Working with Lida Hill Philanthropies, NGCP manages the If Then Collection, a digital library housing photos, videos, and other media of women in STEM fields. These media are available at no cost. NGCP also hosts the Youth Advisory Board. The Youth Advisory Board helps to review and provide feedback on current National Girls Collaborative Project initiatives and assist in informing our future direction. Fab Femmes is an international database of female role models from many STEM fields. They are passionate about the work they do and are ready to connect with programs to spark girls' interest. And then locally, our state collaborative leadership teams offer convenings, they provide professional development when they have funding, mini grants for innovative projects, as well as distributing their own regular newsletters, spotlighting local resources. Next slide, please. 
And then we offer regular webinars just like this one focused on research and exemplary practices to help our network grow and thrive. I put a few quotes on there to share and um, you know, make sure that you sign up so that you can hear about all, all of our webinars. And finally, if you haven't subscribed to our newsletter, please join so you can receive regular updates with resources for your programs and to learn about opportunities and STEM events. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Amanda to introduce you know, our fabulous uh, agenda for today. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for sharing a bit more about NGCP and all the ways that everyone here today can stay connected and get involved with us and all of the resources that we have to share. So some of you might know this, but you might have signed up just for this webinar on its own, but this is actually part of a two-part webinar series. This week, we're talking about how we can address STEM stereotypes with youth and young adults, and next week, we'll be continuing that conversation with how we can address STEM stereotypes with young children. So these are the questions we're going to be talking about this week and next week in this webinar series. What are stereotypes and why do they matter? How do stereotypes impact participation and identification with STEM? When do stereotypes begin to impact children and youth? That's something we'll be talking even more about next week. And both this week and next week, we're really hoping we can answer this question. What are the strategies and approaches for addressing STEM stereotypes? Now, I'd love, this is already a very active group in the chat, but I'd love for you to share a little bit about your own experiences with STEM stereotypes. How do they impact you or the youth you serve? Or do they impact you and the youth you serve? Feel free to share and get the conversation started right now in the chat. But I can tell you a little bit about the research on stereotypes to frame this presentation before I turn it over to our amazing guest speaker. So stereotypes are any fixed or oversimplified belief that um, people might have about a group, a person, or a career. And there are many STEM stereotypes that continue to pervade our culture, the media that youth uh, ingest, as well as just the conversations and the general culture that we are immersed in. So these are some of the stereotypes that I've encountered that many of us have probably encountered, um, but I'm curious to hear what you You've encountered and if you wouldn't mind sharing in the chat and having that conversation about stereotypes that impact you or that you've been exposed to. We're hoping to change the narrative around these to, to counter these stereotypes when they come up in a developmentally appropriate ways with young children, which we'll talk about next week, and with older youth and young adults, which we'll be exploring a bit more of this week. And we know from the research that whether you believe any of these stereotypes that you see on screen here to be true or not, they do impact your confidence and your desire to participate in STEM activities. So they really do play a powerful role in how we identify and participate in STEM. And so along those lines, I'm just so thrilled to have such a large group here willing to talk about how we can change that narrative, how we can begin to counter these stereotypes. And I'm really thrilled to have collaborated with two amazing women that you see on screen here on putting together this webinar today. Now, unfortunately, Michelle Higgins has COVID and we found out today that she was not going to be able to speak, but I wanted to acknowledge her and have her photo and her name on screen here and tell you a little bit about her background. And later in this webinar, I'll be sharing just a few of her slides with a few of her very practical tips on fostering these conversations. And I'll be sharing her email address as well so that you can connect with her after this webinar, even though she was unfortunately unable to be here today. But Michelle Higgins earned a BS in mathematics and an MS in physics, and is currently working on a PhD in educational psychology with a minor in gender and women's studies. In 2012, Higgins co-founded Imagine Your STEM Future, a STEM mentoring program for high school girls that brings informal learning experiences into the formal classroom. The program has grown from one classroom of 30 freshman girls to 140 girls representing all grade levels. As the Associate Director of U Arizona's Societal Impact, Higgins works to translate the expertise of researchers 
into policies, practices, and programs that benefit society and build a more diverse population of lifelong STEM learners. It's also my pleasure to introduce Dr. Claudia Fracciola. Dr. Fracciola is a Venezuelan native and the American Physical Society Head of Public Engagement. She has over 10 years of experience in physics education research, focused on informal learning spaces for fostering discipline-based identity. She won a Marie Curie Fellowship from the European Commission to conduct a two-year research project on understanding how participation in informal physics programs impacts the development of physics identity for those who facilitate them. Her view of public engagement is promoting access to physics and expanding what it means to be a physicist and what practices physicists engage in. So now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Claudia to share a little bit more about her work and her research. Dr. Fracciola. Thank you so much, Amanda, for that great introduction and thank you for inviting me. So such a pleasure for me to be here uh, sharing with you all this and I would absolutely love to hear your stories and your experiences. So I'm going to be talking today about Step Up, which is one of the landmark projects from APS and is done in collaboration with the Florida International University and the American Association of Physics Teachers. Um, next slide, please. There. So um, I always like to start my presentations given some context or background of who I am. And I know Amanda already gave a great introduction. Um, but this is not because I'm a narcissist and I want you all to know my life story, but it is because we are talking about identity and how our experience shape what we do. And, you know, as I said, like, I'm a, na I'm a native Venezuelan, so I consider myself a little bit of an activist, like, not just because I'm a Venezuelan and Latina, but also because I'm a woman in physics, and so I have to carve my way up, uh, you know, and get my space to show that I belong here as much as anybody else's is, um, which sometimes is really hard because I'm also an introverted, so I, I struggle in some of these interactions. Um, so I always joke that, oh, during COVID, like the social distancing aspect was really not that hard for me. And now I have had to like work really hard on get that muscle of socializing back up. Um, and I'm also a runner, even though I don't have a chance to do it as much as I would like to. And the reason that I mentioned that in specific is because sometimes, you know, we question ourselves whether our identities has to be that we are solely focus on some of those activities or are we like central members of those communities but regardless of how much I am running right now I still consider myself a runner I think that that's a really strong part of my identity so next slide please um so one of the reasons that um I wanted to mention that is that I'm part of the statistic right like the framing these conversations starting with my background is because I'm one of those statistics of women in physics, right? Um, the data, this is data that comes from the American Institute of Physics and the Higher Education Research Institute that shows that 50 per, almost 50% 50 of high school uh, physics have like, the representation of high school physics has like almost 50% of girls, but these, drops down to 20% when they get to post-secondary education. So there is a problem that is happening at the high school level that it's pushing girls to continue to pursue careers in physics or in science more generally. And research has shown that many of the factors that influence this disparity is related to social culture factors, right? Such as sense of belonging, identity, lack of seeing ourselves in those roles, which is, you know, stereotypes, like what do we believe that physicists should look like or be? Um, next slide, please. So I've been talking about identity um, and I mentioned that we hold very different identity. We're not just one identity, but there's several different identities within us. And one of those identities is connected to our discipline. So, um, you know, whether you are able to call yourself, you're a physicist or an educator or a doctor, biologist, uh, whatever your, your background is. 
So it's what we define as a discipline-based identity, and it's it's a social social cultural um, construct because what a discipline I, I means is that it is based on norms and practices of that group of the group of people on that particular field, for example, engages in, and we internalize those um, as part of our our identity and. Those norms are and um, practices are defined by the community that participates in it. And so, for example, I'm a Latina. There are a set of characteristics that that surround that group, right? Like normally, uh, Latinas are considered to be loud and very outgoing, even though I'm, I'm an introverted and I don't fit that. Uh, but those are classic stereotypes of what a Latina should be. Um, when some of those cultural norms and practices of some of our identities do not al align, uh, then this creates conflict on other identities that we might develop. So the next slide, please. Um, so with the uh, physics identity, so Zara Azari, who's actually one of the co-founders of the Step Up project, uh, was doing research with her colleagues and they design a framework around what are the factors uh, and, and what how does a physics identity actually get developed and sustained. Uh, they started based on a previous framework created by Carlin and Johnson on science identity. Um, but Zahari's uh, group identified four particular factors as the main reasons how one develops a sense of belonging and identity in physics, which are recognition, interest, competence, and performance. Although later studies have shown that performance and competence are kind of hard to uh, separate, so now have like merged into one. But one of the main things that uh, came out of all these studies is that actually, Recognition and identity are uh, an interest are one of the most important factors on influencing uh, how to choose a career in physics or uh, continue to stay in physics. Um, and if we think about, uh, as we meant, as I was mentioning, like we have different identities, and if those sometimes don't match, it creates a problem. Well, current stereotypes of who are physicists and what physicists look like are centered around white, male, West, Western, often like middle age, and then people who work in labs or do research. And so if you don't fit in those kind of categories, then you might feel at odds with developing that identity. Um, next slide. So after, you know, having, uh, Simone Hayater Ant, who's a, a colleague of mine, and she now is the director of a great program, which I will all uh, let you to look up, is STEM from Dance, uh, which is a program that helps girls uh, learn and identify as scientists by using performance arts uh, to develop this identity. So um, when she was doing her PhD, uh, she started realizing that in order to Developing a physics identity is really hard for underrepresented groups, right? So how do we really understand development of physics identity for those groups? So what we did was we look into not only uh, Hazari's uh, framework of physics identity, but also Nazir's uh, framework on racialized identities. And for Nasir's framework, basically what they define is that how your racial identity comes out, what are the main factors that impact your racial identity? And uh, uh, she identifies three different uh, resources, so like relational resources, which is connected to how we interact uh, with others, the uh, uh, material resources, which is the things that we have access to, and then the ideational resources, which is like ideas of what we have internalized that is value within certain communities. We took this frameworks and then adapted it to a physics context because we were looking into development of physics identity for underrepresented groups and then kind of redefine those categories. Um, next slide, please. 
And so one of the main um, things, well, we re renamed this framework, the critical physics identity framework, because it allows us to understand, you know, that other aspect of how physics identity gets created uh, for groups that might not be the, like what is known as the norm within physics. So one of the main things that came out out of our studies is that um, our racialized identities actually overpower any other identity that we could um, uh, identify with. And so as you can see there, like the, all the blue shades in there represent uh, the uh, times in which when we were looking at analyzing the interviews of people, that the racialized uh, identity was coming out way more than um, the uh, physics identity in itself. And when it becomes a problem is that, as I was mentioning before, if you know, your identity doesn't agree, uh, your racialized identity doesn't agree with current stereotypes of what physics looks like, then that is already a barrier for you to feel like you belong in that community. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in this, you know, this is something that has been done many times for many years. I think it was the first time I saw something like this was 10 years ago, where you actually type the word physicist on Google and do images. And what shows up is that, you know, as we were saying, the majority are middle-aged white men um very western ideas also the colors are very dark bluish uh, a lot of tech kind of things or you know research and teaching are the things that are mostly emphasized uh, and this is like this is literally i did this search like a week ago it's not that all right and i i started seeing this but this kind of um search 10 years ago nothing nothing really seems to be changing fast enough for creating new images that, you know, this is what a physicist looks like. Um, so we, I mean, unconsciously start creating these mental models of what physics looks like, what physicists do, and who does physics. And it starts creating conflict with our own identities, particularly women or, you know, queers or a black, Hispanic, and other underrepresented identities um, in physics. So even though there have been so many different programs that have helped uh, impulse more, more girls and other groups to participate in physics, if the culture and physics in itself doesn't change and we start seeing more of ourselves and our other identities represented in these spaces, then it will be really hard to retain people in these spaces, right? So what we have to start doing and what the main mission of Step Up is, is disrupting this narrative of what physicists look like and what physicists do to create more opportunities for uh, physics identity to form. Um, next slide. Um, so, as I was mentioning, we uh, Step Up started actually a few years, I would say five years ago, uh, with an NSF grant, and the main idea is to increase the representation of women in physics through creating counter narratives. Uh, we are uh, currently have about 100, 1,800 teachers that have gone through the program, um, and what the program offers is like two lessons. So the ones there, the women in physics lesson plan and the careers in physics and the everyday actions, which is a, a guide of how to implement counter narratives in your classrooms or in your informal spaces that go beyond just the, the two specific lessons. Um, the women in physics in particular uh, lessons tries to disrupt this idea of uh, the physics belongs to white and men. Uh, there's a bias and there's a discussion about what is the contribution that women have had in these spaces, 
why there is such a tendency of like majority of men currently still existing in these spaces and how can we counter that? The career emphasis uh, tries, uh, looks at combating these stereotypes by broadening what it means to do physics, what are the practices that physicists engage with, and, um, and then what are careers that you can actually have with a degree in physics? Like, you know, it's not just working in a lab or teaching, but with a bachelor's degree in physics, there's, you know, there's a million of different paths that you can take. And in fact, I always um, joke that the majority of students that I actually get on uh, physics degrees, especially on the first years, are people who want to do uh, law or people who want to go into medicine because if they get good grades <laughs> in a physics degree, then they have more chances uh, on getting into it. Like it's more competitive for them to apply to um, uh, uh, than going to law or medicine. So, but this is not something that at the high school level students understand. And I even remember my own experience, like, when I was uh, my first year of college, um, we decided what we wanted to pursue on our second year. And on, our, on the first year, when I was telling friends, oh no, I just wanna, I wanna be a physicist. My friends were like, no, but what are you gonna do, teach? And this is, this is, a, a, this is a misconception uh, that it is created, it's a stereotype that we have to counter it so that people think that it, there's a broader uh, meaning of what, Businesses do. So next slide, please. Um, so as I said, we currently have over 1,800 teachers that have gone through the program. Uh, well, they haven't been just only teachers. There's many informal uh, science educators that uh, use these lessons for like their summer camps or workshops. Uh, we are ramping up uh, our propagation efforts. Uh, we recently got a grant from the uh, Moore Foundation uh, to expand uh, our efforts, particularly in the regions of uh, California, New York, and um, Illinois. Um, but there are many ways that we can continue to support teachers and educators to help uh, inspire girls to pursue careers in science, and, you know, one of which it is like, I think that um, my research has focused on informal learning spaces because I believe that these are the spaces where we actually can bring our full selves into, right? Like we are not scared in an informal space to fully represent ourselves and who we are and express that openly. So informal learning spaces are perfect for these uh, disrupting these counter, uh, uh, these narrative and these stereotypes and creating counter narratives uh, for uh, what it means to be a physicist and what physicists do. Next, please. So step up goal is to reach 50% representation of um, women pursuing careers in physics. So far, we have about 1,500 girls every year that, um, that decide to go and to pursue a career in physics. And to reach out to like that 50%, we only need four, I know it sounds small, but it's, it's unbelievably hard, uh, is like to get 4,000 more, 4, more girls to choose to uh, uh, pursue a career in physics to achieve that 50% goal. Um, and what this means is that if only one in seven teachers gets to inspire every year one girl to pursue a career in physics, then you know we will reach this number. Uh, and, but in order to do that, we have to support educators and teachers uh, to do that because it's not easy. It's so ingrained on us, like these stereotypes and this narrative, that it's really hard to to constantly provide, you know those counter narrative in the learning spaces. Um, next. So how can you help? Uh, we invite you to join the Step Up community. We provide um, not only the resources that are you know, available online about careers in physics, women in physics, the everyday action. 
We have the guidelines for discussions, with which I'm very proud to say that we now have a Spanish version of it. Um, but there's also, we do um, monthly webinars on how to implement this in your classroom. We're also creating new workshops uh, uh, on, on the applications of the everyday actions and also how to redesign your lesson so that you can implement uh, this counter narrative in your content um, lectures. Um, and we are also working, hopefully in the next few months, you have all our curriculum lessons translated fully in Spanish as well. So, um, and the middle school level, are, currently this is only for high school, but the middle school level, level lessons will come out in November. So stay tuned, sign up, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Facciola, for sharing such exciting and useful information from your work and your research. If you all are like me, you probably have a lot of questions and comments and want to chat with Claudia about what she shared and how you can get started with some of these strategies that she mentioned. We will have time a little bit later in this webinar for your Q&A directly with her. But I wanted to take a minute before we move on to that to share a little bit, just a few tips and strategies from Michelle Higgins' presentation. Um, some of you joined after we did our introduction to this webinar. One of our guest speakers today ended up with COVID and was unable to join today. And I still wanted to acknowledge her work and some of the strategies that she has to share, because I think some of them will be really useful to you, especially knowing that there are many of you informal and formal educators out there wondering, okay, but how do we actually have these conversations about STEM stereotypes? Where do we actually begin? And Dr. Uh, Michelle Higgins' work is all about these conversations. She shares about the power of circles in her work. Circle discussions can foster community in a classroom or in an informal learning setting. And they also serve academic and social emotional purposes. So we'll share in the chat, I think Nancy will put into the chat, a great resource from Edutopia. It's just, you know, a blog post. So it's really simple to digest on how to get started with using a circle practice in your classroom from all the logistics of setting up the physical space to how you go about moderating and running those often difficult discussions. So Michelle broke down in her slides some of the ways you can really get started when you're having a circle uh, community discussion around stereotypes. So starting with creating that common ground, asking participants, participants to identify STEM stereotypes, being ready to fill in more stereotypes. That list of stereotypes that we started with at the beginning of this webinar is a great place to start when you aren't sure what to talk about or how you can fill in more stereotypes that sometimes youth are just not even aware of those being stereotypes. And then being able to provide more information for participants to ponder. This might be informational articles or websites, blogs, or videos. Then she also broke down the rest of this process and how important it is, especially to provide time when you're having these discussions and you're having these circle gatherings to really give participants time to process the questions. So this might come in a few different ways. It might be in the full circle group, checking in about what they're talking about, ensuring that participants aren't feeling alone. It might be individual time set aside for participants to check in with themselves on the topics that are explored. It might be small group time. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we can provide time for processing these questions and these discussions. And when we're thinking about asking probing questions in this type of format, that can sometimes be difficult. Like how do we, you know, get youth talking? How do we get them feeling comfortable? So here's a few examples she provided of probing questions that you can ask. 
You can ask, you know, starting off with do STEM stereotypes still exist? Kind of similar to that question we posed to you at the beginning of this webinar. Um, how or do they impact you? Do they exist at all anymore? Um, you know, rather than coming at it with already uh a negative idea about stereotypes, leaving it up to participants to define that and share that. Asking for their observations. How do you counteract STEM stereotypes? Is there any truth to the STEM stereotypes? So these are all examples of probing questions that can get people talking and exploring, um, perhaps disagreeing and having some really important conversations. Something we talk about in our work at NGCP is that whenever we don't talk about a stereotype, we're actually reinforcing it. So the all of this piece around the circles and this discussions that uh, Michelle has shared is really important because it's forcing us to stop and slow down and be very intentional about discussing these stereotypes that youth and young adults are immersed in and not accidentally brushing it under the rug um, and therefore reinforcing them. So here are some of her takeaway thoughts that I think are really useful. Give participants a chance to process. We talked about that. Listening without judgment. Um, that can be really difficult sometimes, especially if it's a conversation that you feel really heated and really passionate about, um, but attempting to be present and listen without judgment. Understand that perspectives may not change immediately. Our goal might be to expand on stereotyped beliefs or to change viewpoints or how people view certain things, but this change takes time. So we need to continue checking in and to trust the process. And uh, if anyone is interested in staying connected with Michelle, I know she really, really wanted to be here today to share these thoughts herself. Um, here's her email address up on screen here, and maybe we can put it in the chat for you as well. But I would love now to take some time for Q&A with Dr. Fracciola, and I will open up the chat to see what types of questions have been coming up. Nancy, if you got any great questions uh, while this presentation was going, feel free to paste them um, into the bottom of the chat. We do have a question right now for Claudia. Um, you mentioned a goal is to get girls to choose physics and STEM tracks in college, but does step up physics work to combat the negative stereotypes in the workforce? My husband and I had a conversation recently where he said 50% of his graduation class, civil engineering, was women and that they were getting positions with the same starting wage as his male peers. I had to push back and tell him he should follow their career. And I guarantee that after five years, his female peers might, oops, I lost the lost track. Um, his female peers might not be earning uh, the same later on. So did you want to, to jump in at all on that question, Dr. Fracciola? Sure. I mean, I think there's two parts to that question. One, whether we have like step up encourages uh, beyond the college degree. And I have to say, actually, the step up lessons have been used at the college level uh, because these stereotypes are not just impacting people to get to college, right? But people to stay in college, like these counter narratives needs to constantly be put in place so that students uh, persist in physics. So we have actually several faculty and staff at university levels that are doing these lessons in there and having these conversations so that they stay in the field. The thing is that the difference, that the reason why Step Up is focusing on, on the high school level to college transition is because there's that huge drop from having almost 50% representation of female students at the high school level, dropping 30%. So like we only get 20% that actually go into college. And it doesn't seem that that changes much from you know uh, your initial degree to like PhD level or even after that, but it stays within that 20%. Uh, so, so there's a huge gap between high school and and the for your college degree that we're trying to help because then if that means that we that that 20% kind of stays 
sort of level, then if we have 50% representation entering, then hopefully we'll get to support that continue to be until like PhD levels and farther away. Um, so I, I, but also showing that all the possibilities that they can have just with an undergraduate degree in physics is also a value because as like somebody was saying in there, there is also value on, you know, how to use whatever learning you have and implement it in a career path that works for you. And it just doesn't have to be like research or working in a lab or in industry and high impact. Like some of the, the role models that we bring are, you know, the physics girl, for example, like YouTubers, Instagrammers, doing social media. One of the studies uh, that was done actually in the UK uh, says that children nowadays are thinking about what degrees they want to pursue based on the lifestyle that they want to have after they graduate. So connecting what is that with a physics degree is part of, you know, showing that you can have your values and pursue a career that is meaningful for you, even if you have, like, with a physics degree, not even, but with a physics degree or a science degree in general, that you can still contribute to society and have very meaningful, uh, impactful work um, with a career in science. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Okay, I have a little bit of a two-part question. Earlier on, um, someone commented that it's not just about getting girls into STEM spaces. We have to then make them feel comfortable when they're there. And to build on that, a question that was posted just a few minutes ago is how can we help build STEM identity in middle school and high school students if they feel like they don't belong in fields like physics? So I think it's a two-parter. How can, in general, how can we have youth and or girls specifically in this case feel comfortable in STEM spaces once we get them there? And then what if they don't feel comfortable? What if they don't feel like they belong in physics once we get them through the door? Just using physics as an example for you. What are your, your thoughts on that? And how can educators or adults in general help support them? As I always say, there's many different answers for, for this questions, uh, given who is there and what my background is. I would say to make them feel um, comfortable beyond that, right? So I can tell my own story. Uh, uh, so I did my undergraduate degree in Venezuela and actually there, my school was very, very small and my cohort was like 50, 50%. And the head of the department was a woman. So I I don't think I felt, you know, that difference. And I went to an old girls school too. So so I, I didn't face that until actually I came to the US for my PhD. And then when I went to like my first class, it was like a complete shock <laughs> to me. Uh, there were like very, very, like there was only three girls in the classroom about, and it, there was like 30 people in the classroom. and I, I'm very first, like, light color, but I still was the one that looked the most different among everybody else. And what helped me uh, stay in this path was that I had access to a group of people who did informal, uh, like, run informal learning activities for kids. Um, so me facilitating like I love physics and me facilitating these programs and seeing like oh how girls really or kids really enjoy this like help me go through all the struggles that I was doing in, in grad school and that set the path for what I do nowadays which is like you know I continue in physics I graduated in physics but I I want to have more of those informal learning spaces out there because I see the impact that they have and my research shows that all these students, and there actually was a great um, publication came out this week of how the uh, undergraduate and graduate students that participate in informal programs that help facilitate these programs, they develop a stronger sense of identity in physics and help them stay in uh, their degrees. So all the work that the majority of you are all doing in here 
is supporting. And I would like recommend you that if you have a chance to get more students to volunteer in your programs, do that because that is very impactful for them. Uh, in terms of creating like the, um, the making them comfortable uh, in those spaces. So some of the things that Step Up does, but also that uh, were presented on the tips that Michelle's talk was about, it's having these conversations openly, right? Like it, not, not like just saying, oh, you know, we all like girls, let's empower you to feel like that. But talk about this is a reality. There's a bias, it exists. Uh, and you will encounter probably these things, but that doesn't mean that you don't belong here. Uh, and then showing, you know, how, what are their interests? So one of the activities on the career in physics uh, lesson is that there, the students go through a questionnaire of like, what are their values? What are their interests? How uh, does that represent? What are things that they will like to do? And then uh, that, after they click all those things, then the uh, activity like prompts uh, a new um, shows you profiles of people with similar values that have had a degree in physics and this is what are they doing now so it helps them see themselves and imagine themselves in those positions now those things like why that's why we created the everyday actions because those ideas need to be it's not just one interaction and we'll solve it and they will feel comfortable this is something that has to constantly be there like countering those narratives, disrupting the current, uh, you know, status quo of those spaces, like that is something that we need to do every day. So, um, and informal spaces are a great place to do that because we spend more time in those spaces than in actual formal learning classrooms. Thank you. These are great questions and even uh, more amazing answers. Uh, we're getting a few more questions. Here's here's a comment and a question that is really interesting. To go along with this discussion about making girls comfortable in these STEM spaces, how do we help counteract negativity from peers? I've had boys in my programs say things to girls about how STEM isn't for them or they wouldn't like doing something like this, et cetera, et cetera. And while we let Dr. Fracciola get a drink of water or collect her thoughts, I'll share my two cents if I can. I think that is a great question. And I would love for you to come join us next week when we talk about addressing STEM stereotypes with young children because in my work and my research and I and I saw earlier in the chat a couple of you have read my book breaking the stem stereotype a lot of these beliefs and these viewpoints and these stereotypes form so much earlier than we might think. I'm talking preschool, toddler, kindergarten level. And I always say that I think it is just as important for boys or people of any gender identity to from an early age be exposed to you know, amazing diverse role models in STEM, women thriving and succeeding in STEM, female role models and educators who are showing their excitement for problem solving and STEM just in their home and in their school community. I'm not even talking about like a scientist role model. Um, these things need to happen early. And I do believe that they, they boys need to be exposed to these role models and this messaging as much or maybe even more than girls if we want to have them on board um, with countering these stereotypes and dispelling some of these beliefs and hopefully preventing some of this negativity with peers. Um, and I, I, I want to let Claudia jump in if she has anything to add or any thoughts on that question from her own work. Sure. It's funny because I, I was commenting yesterday to Amanda when we were doing like a sound checking and stuff that I was floored when my two-year-old nephew, when came in one day, we were playing like with water guns and then I grabbed one and then he goes like, no, 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 Tata, that's not for you. That's only for granddad, dad, and me. I just boys played with it. And I was like, where did you learn this? Um, because even like my sister, like she constantly tries to make sure that these are not the stereotypes that um, he sees. And the, the step up research shows that when the, the 
the classrooms are exposed to the lessons, these only, these doesn't just impact the girls and how their perception of who belongs in physics is, but like it also has an impact on the boys in the classroom and that they start realizing, uh, you know, their own biases and then being part of that revolution and that countering those narratives. So, you know, while we talk about like, yes, we talk openly about empowering girls to feel comfortable in this spaces, just having those discussions about these biases and then showing also the successes of women in and contribution of women in these fields has also an impact in boys to become advocates and ambassadors for girls to participate in, in science. So 100% with what Amanda said. And I'm sure Michelle would have said something in those similar lines of this. Yes, absolutely. And I think something about um, Michelle's piece is that these discussions that she was outlining, how we can have them, how we can have these circles, um, it wasn't just about having these discussions with girls. It was about all of the youth um, that you might serve and might be in your learning community. I know that questions are still coming in and I want them to keep coming in, but I think because this is such an active chatty group, we can move on to this slide and see what you might have to say or share in the chat. Um, we wanna talk to you about what you'll do after this webinar. Um, what is one strategy or approach or resource that you might dig into? Um, because a lot of times, I know myself included, I'll attend something like this, but I won't think about, okay, now what am I going to do with this information? And I'd love for you to share what you might do with the resources that were shared today, even if that might be you're going to come next week. You're going to you're going to check out some of the resources that were shared from Michelle and Claudia to continue your professional learning on this topic. Um, we would love to just hear how you'll take some of this content and perhaps put it into action, or maybe um, you want to, but you still have a question about how exactly you can do that. This would be a great. Uh, chance to talk about that. And I see in the chat, Trisha and some people, one of the things you want to do next is continue these conversations with anyone who are interested. Absolutely. At NGCP, we love collaborating and connecting. You heard Karen share all about it. Thank you, Trisha, for sharing your LinkedIn in the chat. And maybe, um, Nancy, you can put in the NGCP social media, all those links so that people can continue to connect with NGCP. CP as well. We would love to stay connected with all of you. That's an that's a wonderful next step to build this community um, of resources. And then I also see Trisha um, wanting to put some activities into practice and share with her early STEM group. Wonderful. Some collection development, buying books today that will be used to inform this uh, the conversation and inform your choices. Oh, would love suggestions for books in the chat. That would be great. Uh, Claudia, I don't know if you have any resources or books or websites that you want to suggest. If anyone has any, um, please do uh, share them in the chat. I wanted to mention, as you know, I said earlier, this uh, presentation is going to be recorded and you'll all get the link, but we also archive the chat. So this has been such a great act. I didn't get to see all of the chat while I was focusing on screen sharing, but people have shared so much wonderful information and we share a transcript of the chat as well. So you'll have that as a resource after this webinar. Claudia, are there any great books or resources or things that you personally would recommend? I'm actually typing like, um, so the step of handler and my email, and then I will put like APS public engagement website in there where you can access several resources. And, um, Thank you so much. Wow. Okay. And we know that some people, there is a, I, I seriously, I didn't know someone was going to come in and talk, talk about my book in the chat. It feels like I, I planted uh, Trisha in here, but thank you so much for sharing that book as well as your book club and all of the resources. This is so useful. Um, and uh, we would love to share that out with everyone. I think that would be an amazing resource to list. Um, but this is great. I'm so excited uh, for the discussion to keep happening and for us to continue working together, collaborating, and 
working together to counter these stereotypes. And as we said, they take time and we're not expecting change to happen overnight, but it seems like there's a lot of great ideas happening in the chat right now. So I'm going to move along to telling you, um, well, first off, I want to thank once again, Dr. Claudia Fracciola for coming and sharing your research, your resources, your expertise, but also your personal story. I, I think that is really inspirational to many people who are here, myself included, how you got into this and why you're passionate about what you do. Thank you so much for everything you shared and essentially carrying what was supposed to be a two speaker presentation and panel discussion. And you, and you did it all by yourself. So I really appreciate that. And I know everyone here does as well. If you want to stay connected, and many of you said you wanted to continue these discussions, please join us next Thursday as we talk about addressing STEM stereotypes with young children. We have some great speakers for that as well. And then coming up on November 1st, we have a webinar on STEM stories, women's experiences advocating for equity. And next week, we also have a great panel of young women coming as part of our ongoing Girls Lead STEM work. We'll have a webinar with them and Nancy will put the link and information about that presentation, that girls panel in the chat. If you have any webinar related questions or anything that you want to reach out about, feel free to contact me at my email address on screen here. Um, you can learn more about NGCP at the website on screen here. And Nancy, thank you for putting all those wonderful links and resources to NGCP in the chat. And at this time, I'm going to stop my recording. But first, before I do that, I want to mention that we're going to share our survey, a post survey about this webinar in the chat. And it will also pop up as soon as I close this Zoom event. And we really want to encourage you to fill out that survey because that helps us learn what topics are interesting to you, what you want to learn more about, what speakers you'd like us to bring in. So I didn't want to stop before I made note about that post-survey. It, it's, it's really, really important to the work that we do. But thank you all so much. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you for all the attendees. Thank you for everyone sharing and brainstorming and addressing this issue of STEM stereotypes together. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day.